Hotep, peace and blessings. Welcome to another edition of Ashe. I'm your host, Queen Mother Imaku Mut Shekhamet of Sacred Shrine of Mut Ast and also AkeruRadio.com. Uh, you know, well, last week we started a series of conversations about various facets of African traditional religion and uh, some of the customs that go along with it. I get asked questions all the time about the things that I wear, about uh, including my jewelry, uh, about some of the customs that I do, about my name, and uh, I always take the time and explain to people because it's really important for us to be able to build a bridge by creating dialogue with one another so that we understand exactly why it is that we do what we do, why we believe what we believe. It's not so much about proselytizing or trying to convince somebody else to believe what you believe or do what you do, but again, it's just about building those bridges. I get asked a lot of people, uh, by a lot of people also, who are seeking out uh, African traditional religions and living the culture, as we call it. Uh, young brothers and sisters or those who are seeking to come to a new level of consciousness, new level of awareness. So, with that, I freely share information. Now last week we talked about uh, the raffia that you see up on the wall and how it is uh, used for protection in the same way as a broom. It's from the broom tradition. We talked about how to create a sacred altar for your home. Well, we're going to talk about more aspects of the culture, but I also brought back some of the objects from last week so I could explain more about what they are. Now in the, uh, the shrine that I set up we had all four directions that were represented. We had air. Last week I had a cone of incense to represent the air. This week I have a feather. You can also use a feather. Feathers, in representing air, uh, air is the intellect. Air is about communication. It is swift moving energy and uh, we have it in the sacred east. And with air being a, a rapid transition and, and communication that we recognize as also being the direction that the motherland sits in. So generally, when ritual starts, we are facing east. That is the first direction that we face because we are facing the motherland. Now, uh, it was traditional for many uh, enslaved Africans to ask that they be buried with their head facing south and their feet face, I'm sorry, head facing west, feet facing east, because that put them in the direction of home, of the motherland. Some people still carry out those same traditions today. Uh, so we're mindful of where the motherland sits, the cradle of civilization, which is in the sacred east. Now, this candle represents fire. Fire uh, is creativity, and it is... Um, it is also a form of swift moving energy, but uh, fire also represents the life force, the very energy that runs in our bodies. In the Kemetic tradition, which is my tradition, it's known as Ra or Re. Uh, it is depicted by the sun. Now also just to clarify some things, it was believed that ancient Egyptians worshipped the sun. They didn't worship the sun, no. What they were doing was showing honor to the life force, you know, to the life, to life that runs in everything. Uh, it's believed that everything has energy. I mean, even uh, this table, this drum, uh, this book. And so uh, it is honoring of all energy because it's the energy that connects us together. It binds us all. In the West, we have water. Now, last week I showed you how I was, I was make good use of great bottles. This is a great bottle. This had cones of incense in it, but I've since emptied it and put water in it. And uh, water represents emotions. It is said that uh, 
in various African traditions that a person who is not connected fully to their emotions is somebody who you really can't fully put your trust in. Um, in fact, speaking of water, in this book of Water and Spirit, which happens to be one of the books that I recommend for this week, Dr. Maladoma Somme, who I recently interviewed, it was a wonderful, wonderful uh, full interview, uh, is talking about being of both worlds, about being part of um, uh, the, the culture of his people, but then also being westernized. And, and within that, uh, prophetically was expected to come back bearing information about Western society so there could be a greater understanding of what was going on, but also uh, the, uh, the notion that he also was bringing an understanding to the West about African traditions. And with that carries a message also to African Americans about claiming African traditions, honoring that we are here. We are in the West, but also that our roots are in the motherland. And many Africans are, or, or Africans in this country are doing that today. And there's a movement that is called new, the New African uh, Movement that is taking place. And so, but anyway, in this book, he also mentions uh, about being a water priest. Uh, I recently was initiated into the uh, water priestess tradition of the, uh, the Shona and Debele tradition. And it's the path of, of peace and also of great compassion, which again, is the emotion. And, uh, but again, in the book he, he mentions about, um, well, he goes into detail about how his grandfather, his beloved grandfather, who was the great healer of their uh, tribe, he passes away. And the story in itself is dynamic. It, it's, it's just, um, uh, it, it, you, you find yourself trying to suspend your belief because when you see metaphysically all the things that, that happen as a norm within their society but are actually possibilities. But um, anyway, the, the funeral was quite an elaborate affair. And the way that it started was with everyone weeping people coming from uh, um, neighboring villages because they knew of this great healer who had passed away. And um, the significance of everybody being able to get to a place of weeping, of mourning, of, of bringing forth tears, even the great warriors, if they were having trouble summoning up the emotions that they needed to get to in order to grieve properly, then there were people around them who were helping them to bring up those feelings. And uh, because they knew that in order to properly go through the grieving process, that they had to pull those emotions up and work through them. So uh, in it, that's where he says in their society, um, and they're in the origins of African society also, that being in tune with the emotion is, uh, uh, is, is key as far as uh, the, the kind of character that you possess and your connectedness to everyone and everything. So, uh, the West again is water. And then we have the stone, which represents Earth, which is North. Now, a lot of people lately are really keyed into the Earth energy because Earth represents uh, material possessions, it represents money, it represents. Um, all things that deal with security issues, um, housing, clothes, um, your bank account. And so there are a lot of folks who ritualize and they stay focused on that, that uh, uh, earth energy. But um, the, the earth also represents the root. I talk a lot about uh, our chakras, or in our tradition we call them aritu. And the uh, base arit is the earth arit, which is the foundation, which is the earth. All of our security lies within the root. And um, it is also about taking chances, appropriate risks, not going too far out on a limb, but knowing when it is appropriate to go out on a limb and when it's appropriate to just keep your behind home. So uh, earth is, is uh, very important to stay keyed into. Now talking about some of the other sacred objects, and you know, I, I talked about water and I left this bottle here. Many of you have probably heard of this. Maybe you've seen this and wonder what it is. This is called Florida water. Now, uh, whether all Florida water comes from Florida or not is not really the question. The question is how effective it is because w Florida water is used for purification of uh, the home and of, uh, of any number of, 
of uh, items or, or if you go to a place and you spill some on the floor for purification, um, a lot of folks will put this in their, um, their cleaning water. Uh, for instance, when, when I am sweeping down my front steps or even my back porch or my, my back deck, then uh, after I've swept it down, I have a solution of um, salt water and also Florida water that I include in the, um, uh, the water to wash down the porch. And also uh, then after that, I'll, I'll just spill some more down for protection. So um, uh, Florida water is used for that. And then people will often clean their walls when they move into a new space. They'll put some Florida water in it. So it's a very, very strong protective and cleansing agent from a spiritual standpoint. This is an Ankh. Ankhs were the uh, original cross. It was the original cross. And it means life. Now, people will ask me about it all the time. You know, what exactly is that? It's, it's, it's beautiful. Can you explain it? Uh, people are always uh, uh, attracted to my ring. You know, I wear this big Ankh ring. And uh, if you, I don't know if you can get in tight on that, but you can see the, there are two arms that are hugging the, um, the Ankh itself. And uh, so, I mean, it's a wonderful symbolization of embracing your life. And uh, so that's exactly what the Ankh encourages us to do. It encourages us to embrace life. Uh, technically speaking, uh, some say that it represents the, uh, the womb and the fallopian tubes of the woman and then also the male member. That's one explanation of it. The deeper explanation really is that this is the horizon. This is the river Hapi or the Nile as it, or as it came to be called, but the original name was Hapi. And this represents the sun over the horizon. And there is an epic story about the battle of Heru and Set. And uh, long story short, the extremely condensed Reader's Digest version, um, Heru was uh, seeking vindication for uh, his father's throne. His father had been killed and the family thrown out of the kingdom. Heru grows up and goes to uh, uh, battle his, he, his evil uncle who has uh, uh, created a reign of terror in Kemet. And so when he battles um, and Heru wins, it is day. When they battle and Set wins, it is night. The final battle brought about victory in the sun finally emerging over, emerging over the horizon. But it also represents our overcoming our what is called lower nature, all of those, those bad habits that we try to get past, um, you know, the bad character traits, because we all have positive and we have negatives. But uh, the idea is that every single day we face challenges. And so the question is, who's going to win the battle this day? Is it going to be Heru or is it going to be Set? So uh, the, the Ankh is a very, very deep symbol uh, in the ancient Kemetic lore, but also because of the fact that with Kemet, that's where uh, all religions sprang from. So even no matter what African traditional religion is, is uh, uh, expressed, there is always a hearkening back to the mother religion, which is the Kemetic religion. Uh, these we have seen all over the place. I mean, first of all, people think of the Washington Monument. This is uh, known by some as an obelisk. Uh, the common comedic term that is used in African traditional religion is a tekken. And this represents the male principle. And um, also, it, it uh, goes along with the, uh, the focus on identity, uh, strength in the, uh, the yang element. And uh, so these originated in Kemet. And uh, all over Washington, D.C., there are various symbols that were borrowed from uh, Kemet. And the main one that most people can identify with, of course, is the Tekken. Now, we've talked about various aspects of African traditional religion and also the Kemetic uh, beliefs. But this is something that you find in quite a few southern homes or people who have an understanding of southern roots. 
my family on my father's side came out of the Gullah tradition. And I have many friends who have kept me in touch with those roots. One of the common things is to have a horseshoe. Horseshoes, of course, people know represent good luck. But uh, with the horseshoe, it is much deeper than that. I mean, if you think about a horse, a horse, uh, it, by putting a shoe on the horse's um, hoof, you're preparing it for its travels. And so uh, the horseshoe represents the hope for well-prepared uh, travel and wherever it is that life is going to take you. Uh, now, it's always important to keep it facing up because the belief is that if you keep it up, like a cup or also for people who are um, who practice some um, Orisha traditions, uh, they like to get things like horseshoes because it's 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 iron, and the rustier it is, the the, the p greater the power, and so you may see them in ogun shrines, you know that type of a thing. So um, this is the the horseshoe, and. Uh, you know, I spoke about uh, the Gullah traditions. Out of the traditions of our ancestors in captivity came up a, a, a um, well, I can't even say it's a belief system, but um, a system of uh, practice uh, in terms of uh, various cultural, cultural ways and uh, ways of being able to move energy through what is called hoodoo. Hoodoo is a, um, it is a folk tradition. Um, some people will, um, they call it roots. And um, uh, a, a lot of the hoodoo that is practiced uh, can be traced back to various parts of Africa. Now you remember, uh, our ancestors were brought here in captivity from all different parts of the motherland. So there was, if you will, a melting pot of traditions that happened uh, in order to survive. Okay, I remember this part of this, you, you know, let me take this, or let me share this with you, you know, piecing, piecing together. And um, also with the Native Americans who were here. So all that blended together to become what is known as hoodoo. This other book that I'm recommending, and I'm looking, recommending to this week, is Stick Stones, Roots, and Bones. Uh, Hoodoo Mojo and Conjuring with Herbs by Stephanie Rose Bird. Now, this sister has put out quite a compendium of um, not only of Hoodoo traditions, but also of African traditional religious um, traditions. And uh, so she breaks down exactly about Hoodoo. She breaks down about uh, the various traditions brought here, uh, you know, the various aspects of what it is that we still practice today. And um, it, it, it's, it's quite, quite well put together. But uh, I mean, she breaks down so much about the different um, aspects. In fact, um, just to give you an example, uh, she uh, talks about, uh, she has something about altars, um, as I had mentioned about last week. Uh, she talks about the different elements, fire, water. Um, just to read a chapter here, she says, when full engagement of my ancestors or the person I am working with is needed, I incorporate a bowl of Florida water on the altar. If mourning, death, or remorse is involved, I use Kananga water, which she talks about in another chapter. For banishment of evil, such as unhexing or uncrossing, I use, she says, either a bowl of kosher, kosher sea salt, sea water, or holy water. One of the other things that she talks about in this book is, again, the, the importance of water. And being a water priestess, of course, that's, that's of great um, importance to me. But um, uh, one thing that she did through the book remind me of was the importance of collecting rainwater. Natural rainwater is, is uh, extremely powerful to use for uh, various rituals, for purification, you know, that type of a thing. I would highly recommend this book. <coughs> Now, going on, didn't really get to touch too much on this last week. Um, this is a tongue drum. Uh, probably the next show I'll probably play it. And uh, it's, it looks like a box with grooves in it. But it makes all kinds of wonderful 
wonderful, wonderful sounds. I don't have the sticks with me, so that gives you an idea. You feeling that? <laughs> I showed last week the talking drum, but I want to share with you the last part of our show here, one of my favorite instruments. This is called a djembe. Now, I usually walk around with that in the, the djembe bag. I always get all kinds of looks. My bag's pretty beat up, so I think some people kind of wonder exactly if I'm homeless or something, but um, also the fact that the drum is so big, and a little me carrying around this drum. But uh, today, I stopped at a store before coming here to, uh, to grab something, and uh, the gentleman looked down and said, is that a djembe? I said, yes, you know, very few people know exactly what it is. But the djembe has become extremely popular in this country uh, because of Babatunde Olutunji. Don't mind me as I, if I, if I, as I hike up my skirt here. Uh, because of the fact that it's such a musical, truly musical drum, um, there are so many different tones that you can get from it. You know, the heavy bass in the middle and then the tones on the side. Uh, it's become quite popular also because it's, it's pretty easy to carry. But um, the djembe, for some, some, for some reason, is believed to only be a male instrument. I don't believe so. And on top of that, historically, the drum always belonged to the woman first. I uh, speak quite a bit to women and do a lot of women's workshops with the drum, saying reclaim this and uh, recognize the fact that this represents the womb, the heartbeat, and the, the mother. So uh, it was originally a healing instrument in addition to being uh, an instrument of celebration. So um, I wanted to share a little bit of the djembe with you before we leave. This piece uh, is called Herokuhuti's Resurrection. Djembe, as I said, is a wonderful instrument of healing. I find that for days when I'm a little stressed, I'll pull out my drum. And um, recently when I was initiated uh, as a water priestess, I spent an hour and a half straight sitting out by the water just drumming and moving energy. And it was, it was so incredibly peaceful. Uh, people tell me all the time that they get stressed out, they come in from work or they get depressed and they pull out the drum. The drum pulls up so much energy. Uh, there have been times I've gone to perform and I've had like maybe this little sleep, but then once I've started drumming, all this energy just comes out of nowhere. It's a wonderful way to be able to communicate, and especially if you're in a circle of people, then you're communicating heart to heart. And it, t it takes everybody to be able to work together to bring forth that energy and to, uh, to create whatever is trying to be created, whether it's, again, celebration or whether it's for healing. Um, but again, it's important to have that heart to heart connection with everybody on the same page. Now, the very, very last thing, actually, I want to leave you with, because I didn't get to talk about this earlier, is this, uh, this cloth. This is called mud cloth. This literally is put in the soil. And um, at times, certain dyes are applied, uh, but still, most of the color comes from the richness of the soil. 
every single uh, piece of cloth has its own pattern, which tells its own story. Now, last week I had a mud cloth print that was uh, that I was wearing, but this is actual mud cloth that comes from the motherland. And so, if you can see that there, these are strips that are sewn together. Each uh, strip first is sewn together for one huge garment, or it can also be that there are several strips that are of different patterns and different colors that are sewn together to create this uh, this wonderful wonderful cloth. I've made dashikis from it. In future shows, I'll teach you how to make a, your own dashiki or your own buba or boo boo. And uh, you know, again, it, it's it, a lot of uh, homes use it where you use a decorated table. I have a huge piece of uh, multicolor mud cloth that sits on my uh, my couch. And uh, so, the wonderful thing, though, the, the exciting thing that you might want to do is, if you happen to get a piece of mud cloth, is to see if you can find out what the story is that's being told. If you have any other questions regarding African culture, please feel free to contact me, Imaku Mut Shekamet. Actually, my full name, or Ren as we say in Kometic culture, is Queen Mother Imaku Mut Shekamet Hetep Ma'ati Eyele Yatunde. Uh, but most people call me uh, commonly Imaku. And uh, you can reach me at my website, which is, say it with me now, www.mwtshekemet.org. There's also the Shrine website. Uh, the shrine is another way of saying temple, which is Sacred Shrine of Mut, M-W-T, A-S-T, A -S -T, dot org. And finally, there is the radio station, uh, which is an offshoot ministry of Sacred Shrine of Mut, A-S-T, Akiru Radio, that's triple W A K E R U radio.com, which has all kinds of cultural information, which has uh, uh, spiritual information from various African traditional religions, a number of hosts on sharing information and motivational material uh, that is uh, designed to inspire you every day so that you're able to make it on your journey. And certainly we all know that on this journey, we we need one another. I was just discussing with our camera person Wheezy beforehand about how it is that we were talking about how life is hard. It is hard. But you know what? Somehow when you come together with like-minded people, it makes it a little bit easier. We need one another. So let's keep that communication open between us. This is Imaku Mutshekomet. And um, I wish you peace, Shemhotep. Claim your personal power. Ashe. Yeah.